Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Glad to have you back with us as we take issues of homeland security and national security and bring them home to you. Help us to do that today. We're going to be talking to Dr. Barbara Quarum, who's the director of the USA Center, a part of the School of Rural and Public Health within the Health Science Center at Texas A&M University. Dr. Quarum, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Dave. Thanks for having me. Now, um, that's a kind of long title. I guess I need to break that down a little bit. Uh, the Health Science Center is part of the Texas A&M system, mm -hmm. but not actually part of Texas A&M the way we usually think of it at College Station. Would you explain that? Correct. The Health Science Center is a uh, separate organization within the within this system. Uh, it is located here. It is housed and centralized here in College Station. It includes the College of Medicine, uh, the School of Nursing, the School of Rural Public Health, a Baylor College of Dentistry, College of Pharmacy. So we have the health professions, uh, careers, and education uh, centralized in one place okay. and available across across the entire state. And you actually have schools that are scattered around the state of Texas that yes. address those issues. Yes, in, in Corpus Christi is the pharmacy school, uh, Baylor College of Dentistry is in Dallas. Mm -hmm. There is a South Texas Center uh, for the Health Science Center that is in McAllen. So we do have students and locations around the state. Now you mentioned within the Health Science Center, you have the School of Rural and Public Health, mm -hmm. um, where you direct a USA Center. Right. T tell us what exactly is public health, because it's not what most people think of. Right, public health deals with population health, health of groups of people, communities, uh, universities and all of the students, even our neighborhoods. Uh, Public health tends not to focus on delivery of health care services, certainly not exclusively, as does medicine and nursing and some of those. We tend to look at the broader perspective of the overall health of the population, the community at large, and mm -hmm. we address things from a uh, preventive uh, nature, from a health behavior, mm -hmm. from a community emergency preparedness side. So we tend to look at the bigger picture of large groups of people. So um, public health wouldn't necessarily look at cardiology, but it might look at heart disease writ large. Exactly. Heart disease, obesity, uh, tobacco related issues. Mm -hmm. Problems with cancer. Aging issues and, and needs problems with cancer, those kinds of things. Also, things like our food safety mm -hmm. and our mm -hmm. water supplies, restaurant inspections, uh, disease prevention, uh, investigation of disease outbreaks. So it's not about uh, healing me personally when I'm sick, but it's about keeping me and all of my friends and all of my neighbors well on a day-to-day -day basis. Exactly, and we tend to take public health for granted mm -hmm. because it isn't quite as visible to us as some of the actual service deliveries. Now, you're in the School of Rural and Public Health. Exactly. This is a special challenge in rural areas. Why exactly. is that? Exactly. We're the only school of public health in the nation, the first in the nation, with a rural focus. Uh, our rural communities rarely have uh, the assets, mm -hmm. the funding to work with, to have a local health department, to have bricks and mo mortar and people whose job it is is to be part of the local health department. So they tend not to have a health department at all. In Texas, for example, we have 154 of our 254 counties that do not have a local health department in their county. Uh, the, the state through its state health department through its regional office steps in to assist, but still they lack that focus around mm -hmm, public mm -hmm, health. Mm -hmm. So we work with them particularly to help bring other people together to engage in discussions well, around public health. Well, how do you do that? How, what do we do with a county that's got thousands <laughs> of people, it's uh, maybe two hours by one hour to drive across, and it doesn't have a public health official exactly. because it can't afford one? Uh, 
actually by law there is a local health authority mm -hmm. required in every county and that is a physician uh, who's but it may be dual headed it's or someone else. who generally is a family practitioner in the county if there is such a person mm -hmm whose job it is is to report communicable diseases, and that's the ex mm -hmm. usually the extent of it. Uh, in other cases, if there isn't someone, and we have counties where there are no health practitioners mm -hmm. as well as no public health personnel, then the state wears that hat for them too. Um, now you have programs that train people yes, to deal with this situation. Exactly, we, we train members of the current public health workforce, mm -hmm. but we also go in and work with community leaders we work with county judges and commissioners, mm -hmm. the school nurses, veterinarians, mm -hmm. cooperative extension agents, in how to begin to address public health in your county when you don't have a local health department. Now you've, you've done a lot of work, your program's done a lot of work along the border. There's yes. a great example of a special problem. Yes. Rural areas, uh, not necessarily a public health uh, uh, mm -hmm. program or mm -hmm. structure, and yet serious problems that could go back and forth across the border. Exactly. What, what have you done in that area? We have looked at, and our work with the border goes back about 10 years, where we used, I actually was able to utilize um, a telehealth opportunity to connect some of the border uh, health providers and clinics to areas of expertise. So telehealth uh, meaning electronic? Electronic versions. But what we have done is we've gotten to know the border communities better is to identify the promotoras population, the mm -hmm. community health workers. And we actually have an ongoing training program that's part of the certification mm -hmm. process where we work with the promotoras and teach them a variety of skills that they can use in their colonious communities mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as well as in some of the clinics, help them identify issues, conduct health promotion and prevention activities, participate in community preparedness, um, and of course that serves to keep the larger population as a whole healthy by finding, identifying, uh, and uh, restricting uh, diseases uh, that might be special exactly. to that community. Exactly, and by providing skills and knowledge to the grassroots folks who are part, accepted and trusted parts of sure. those communities. Now I would guess a great example <coughs> of that would be the current uh, problems that we're facing with flu. I know that's uh, the top of your inbox. Talk about that just a little bit, what, yes. what, uh, how public uh, uh, health is addressing this issue. Well. The novel H1N1 flu is very much at the top of our, mm -hmm. our list and has been for some time. For the last four years, we have been working at the federal level, the state level, and the local level to help our counties mm -hmm. prepare for what we have called pandemic influenza. Mm -hmm. Unknown influenzas come in waves, mm -hmm. and the timing is about right for something new to emerge something that is unknown to us that we do not have resistance to, uh, and to begin to help communities think in advance and prepare for that. Mm -hmm. So we have been able, through work with our counties and development of plans, educational mm -hmm. programs, uh, actually educating and practicing, exercising and practicing those plans, we've been able to help our communities be better prepared. What's happened right now is the flu that we're currently experiencing mm -hmm. is new. It is at a different time sequence than one normally sees mm -hmm. the flu, but our normal seasonal flu is also circulating and it's running later than it usually does. So something so very unusual. Both things are happening right now also. Uh, and that means you do expect to see this uh, continue again in the cold weather next year? It, it's continuing to mm -hmm. grow. Uh, we are seeing numbers increase right now. It has not gone away. And our efforts at the moment are, are spent 50% looking at and mm -hmm. getting to know this virus better, understand its impact in the different age groups that are involved now as opposed to the traditional mm -hmm. flu uh, those who are in affected by flu. At the same time, we're trying to plan ahead and anticipate what we need to be doing for this fall. Dr. Barbara Quarum is the director of the USA Center, a part of the Health Science Center, teaches rural and public health here at Texas A&M University. Thank you very much, Barbara, for being with us.
Welcome back to Bring It Home, where today we're going to talk about the issue of what is terrorism? What is the nature of terrorism as we try to take issues of homeland security and national security and bring them home to you? Previously on other segments, we've talked about the question of what is war? What's the nature of war? How, how is war waged? I'm going to review that very briefly and then move on to compare that and contrast it with terrorism. I guess the fundamental point I'd make to you is that war is um, uh, defined in a variety of different, many people have defined it in different ways. The way we have defined it is that war is violence used for political ends. It's trying to achieve some uh, overthrow of the other government, some territorial goal, and uses violence. Not just the threat of violence, but violence. It is waged, however, within the rules, and that we made as an important distinction about what makes war different from other forms of uh, behavior. Now, I know some people think that maybe we can outlaw war, and I applaud that. If you can make that work, fine. But over history, the fact has been that periodically nations engage in war because sometimes they're justified. They're justified because the war itself is justified. We're responding to somebody else's aggression. Um, however, you must be, uh, behave certain uh, ways, uh, obey certain rules within the way you conduct the war. And then after the war is over, it's not fair to simply subjugate and enslave the nation that you've conquered. So war is violence for political ends waged within the rules important, under, important uh, uh, concepts. How then do we wage war, uh, given that understanding of what it constitutes? How do you select a national strategy? Well, you have to have a political strategy, an economic strategy, a military strategy. Understanding that strategy is a theory of cause and effect to achieve victory against a thinking enemy over time. All of these points are, just, are addressed in detail in previous YouTube uh, programs and previous educational television programs that we've released. Uh, as you craft that strategy, understand that victory is not getting everything you want. It's getting what you'll settle for at a price you're willing to pay. And in addition to thinking about political uh, strategies and economic and military, you have to remember your domestic issues at home. New to this concept of, uh, of uh, how you wage war is the issue of should there, you include an information strategy. It's only in the recent years we've really begun to think about that. Now the military has an acronym for this. They call it D-I-M-E, thinking about diplomacy, information, military, and economics in waging war. And I'd suggest they ought to modify that with an additional D, and that is the domestic. And then finally, uh, you, whatever your strategy is, it can be applied against what Clausewitz called the centers of gravity, the hub of all power and movement. And they essentially break out into against the people, against the military forces, against the leadership in order to break their capability or their will. So that's essentially the target sets for war. Waging war then uh, with an understanding of war, and by that I mean demographics and uh, history and culture, of the enemy and yourself, you can craft a strategy. From that you develop operations. The operations you develop tactics. From the tactics you develop fighting, uh, how to fight, and then uh, raise your forces and develop your weapons using all the national resources at your disposal and all the elements of national power. Now, if you do that, if you think about that, you realize how complex war is and how vital. It's an issue of, of uh, life and death and this is the link between national security and security at home. So what about terrorism? With that as a background, we've uh, examined in uh, depth in other segments. What is terrorism? What's its nature and how is it waged? Um, there have been a variety of definitions, more than 132 have been identified for terrorism. But let me ask this question. Is it in fact violence waged for political end? Yes. So is it war? Well, yes, but it's not just war because it's not waged within the rules. So is it just crime, like holding up a convenience store or a bank robbery? No, because it's for political ends. So essentially, terrorism is criminal war. Now I understand this is different from what, the way most uh, experts approach it, but, but that's from a strategic perspective. It is the use of illegal ways or illegal men, uh, means or to achieve illegal ends or some mix of illegality here. Now, I've had people tell me, hey, uh, you're prejudicing this in favor of the state. Uh, sometimes the small uh, people are not necessarily wrong. I'm talking about from the victim's perspective. I'm not talking about right or wrong or good or bad. I'm trying to get across to you this point. If you think the rules are that you should bring five guys and a basketball to the game, and the other guy thinks the rules are that he should show up with 11 guys and a hockey stick, one of you is in for a bad surprise. It's not a matter of good or bad, right or wrong. It's a matter of how you interpret those rules. So when you get right down to the nature of terrorism, at its core, it's cheating on the rules. Not, not whether I approve the rules or not. 
And maybe, the, maybe from Osama bin Laden's perspective, we cheat by dropping bombs from 15,000 feet instead of going man to man with a knife or an AK-47. But the point is, a strategy that provides an unfair advantage, that unbalances what Clausewitz called the trinity of, uh, of uh, um, uh, people and leadership uh, and uh, passion and chance, an attempt to destroy essentially the system, to control, to destroy control over war and to destroy legitimacy. Terrorism at its core is an attack on the system. Clausewitz said that the first supreme, most far-reaching act of judgment, the thing you have to understand is the kind of war that you are facing, you're embarking upon, and that if you mistake it, you've made a terrible mistake. This is the first of all strategic questions. I would ask you, what kind of war is this, an attack of children on children in Beslan and Chechnya? What kind of war is this, an attack on children where American troops were handing out candy in Iraq? What kind of war is this, an attack on the Moore office building where the attacker disregarded the child care center on the ground floor? Terrorism is criminal war waged against the legitimacy of the system. If you understand that as you're going in position, then you're going to better understand how to craft a solution. Hope you'll come back for more. Learn more with us. Let's examine the nature of terrorism and what we do about it here on Bring It Home. Well, we're back on Bring It Home, where we take concepts of homeland security and bring them home to you. And we're talking right now with Dr. Anders Satterfeld, who's the Associate Director of Human Resources at Texas A&M, where she supervises employee assistance programs and employee relations. And it's a lot more interesting, actually, than that sounds, isn't it, Anna? Absolutely. She, her doctorate is in counseling psychology. She's a licensed psychologist. And uh, important for us today, she's a member of the Task Force on Campus Emergencies here at Texas A&M. Yes. Thank you very much for being with us, Anna. Certainly. Boy, uh, 10 years ago, no one would have thought of a licensed uh, uh, psychologist at a um, university as being part of Homeland Security, but things have changed, haven't they? They have. Our role has certainly become more integrated into day-to-day -day operations with that and, and really asking us to look at behavioral analysis and patterns and trends that we see in our employees. Let's start by uh, setting up what I think is an important tone, and that is that uh, true or false, in the United States of America, one of the absolute safest places you can be on a day-to-day -day basis is a college campus. True or false? Absolutely true. Absolutely true. A uh, large number of people, but safer than a city street? Absolutely. It's, violence in general on campus is really a low base rate. We don't see it all that often. So really uh, uh, issues of uh, crime, uh, assault, uh, property crimes, uh, much lower than even in many rural areas. Yes, you're correct. Now, having said that, I got to tell you that as an outsider, not in the field of counseling, looks to me like we are having an increasing number of incidents at universities and colleges, uh, high schools, and also that they're increasing in severity. Is that just because I'm watching more news or is that really happening? I think the media is capturing it a lot more frequently now. Mm -hmm. It still remains a low probability event, but it has high risk consequences and that's what we really want to pay attention to. And now, the shooter the business in particular, that because they have access uh, to uh, weapons now, they're so high powered, you, you get a lot of casualties if something like that happens. Yes. You're correct. Well, let's talk about how you approach that and how your profession, the, the issue of uh, counseling, has been brought in, because you're not a counselor on a day-to-day -day basis. How have you been brought in professionally into the whole structure of a university? What we've done on the employee side is really begin to focus on how do we make our employees more productive? And we know that stress in everyday life certainly impacts people as they go to work. We would hope they would leave it at the door, but unfortunately that doesn't happen. <laughs> and so what we want to do as counselors is help those people become the best employee that they, that they can. We help supervisors develop better communication skills, know how to work with certain employees, mm -hmm. and really begin to intervene with employees who show productivity problems because our goal is to retain them. Pro productivity is a very important point and retention is a very important point. Absolutely. Because this is not just a counseling the way I sort of learned it in the Army, sit down at the footlocker, I got a piece of paper to discuss with you. Uh, really you also develop programs, you try to set, uh, change the tone perhaps in the classroom or in the employment place. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a variety of presentations that you put together. Talk to us just a second about setting the proper tone with employees and with students at a university. Sure. We basically take a community psychology approach and that is helping my helping people identify their 
potential and how they can be the most productive person that they can. So we set programs dealing with stress management, interpersonal issues that they want to work on, as well as relationship issues because we know all of us interact with people every day and that's the foundation of everything we do. So a better, more productive, happier place to work, you get fewer problems. You're correct. Also, it's interesting to me uh, from a Homeland Security perspective that this whole concept of personal productivity and personnel problems has been sort of melded into the emergency management realm. The mm -hmm. same people that are dealing with those mm -hmm. issues, the same committees and groups, are also dealing with response to hurricanes, to tornadoes, to power outages and so forth. That's something new, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Because what we're trying to do is the early intervention programs and mm -hmm. keep everybody stressed reduced, whether that be the emergency workers mm -hmm. or those that have experienced some type of trauma. So you also get the same sort of team that's involved because whether you're responding to a tornado, I mean the same, we use code maroon, getting the word out on a problem. Whether you're responding yes. to some act of violence or whether you're responding to some uh, weather emergency, you're using the same communication systems. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Well, uh, let me ask you a tough question uh, that I'm sure people will be will want to hear the answer to this question now. Who's hardest to work with, students, faculty, or staff? Wow. I guess I would have to say the older we are, the more entrenched and ingrained we are in our behaviors and we're less likely to change. So that's probably the best way for me Is to that describe the best way? it. That's My sister best gave way. me a, a shirt for Christmas and it says, if I'm talking, you should be taking notes. <laughs> so uh, would it be fair to say that people who do that for a living uh, are, are pretty tough for you to work with, you to approach? Yes, very much so. They're very intelligent. They know a lot about world events and a lot of material that they talk about every day. Let's talk about what they need to know. What are the issues that you want to, when you talk about personnel interventions now, mm -hmm. when we talk about a potential crisis, what kinds of things should we be looking for? What we're always trying to do is, again, retain the employee, mm -hmm. but we're looking for warning signs that give us a suggestion that that employee may be struggling. It could be stress on the job. It may be that their productivity has declined. Perhaps they're exhibiting something that suggests substance abuse problems mm -hmm. or mental health issues, or they just don't seem to be getting along with coworkers very well. Uh, Anna, in retrospect, being, being very serious for a minute because we have had a number of incidents in the United States, uh, Virginia Tech, uh, high school shootings, Columbine, we've had a number of employee shootings, mm -hmm. we've had a number of such violent incidents. And almost uniformly after the incident is over, when they do the post-mortem of the whole event, they realize that A, there were lots of warning signs present, and B, everybody knew something was wrong. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Violence is a process and it does not occur in a vacuum. And frequently there are red flag or concerning behaviors that have been going on for quite some time. It's just that nobody connected the dots. Everybody had a different piece of the puzzle and didn't know that somebody else had something else that might bring that context into kind of a different cognitive so thinking. We think of an explosion, <laughs> but in fact, uh, this was frequently uh, days, months, years in a build up and very complex and the reason a person decided to act out. Absolutely. Now, what do we do about that. If I'm a faculty member, if I'm a student, if I'm a, a co-worker, remembering that we want to retain the person. This is not about finding somebody to shun and eliminate from society. What, what kinds of things can we do? What do we do here at our university? Well, what we have established is a special, special situations team, and the goal is to identify at-risk behaviors prior to any type of violent incidents. So we want to identify any students, faculty, or staff that are struggling in day-to-day -day life. Any behavior that's getting in the way of working, learning, or living environment is pretty much how we decide to express that. But that team has to be very careful about privacy because we don't want to ruin somebody's life or career on the basis of what might be an unfounded report. Absolutely, and that's why the team does work very hard to analyze the report that it comes in to gather information prior to even taking any actions. Big, big uh, question. As a faculty member, as a staff member, when I sense that there's something wrong with a coworker or a student, but I don't want to approach them directly, now what do I do? How do you get to that team? Sure. We have multiple ways here at the university, and we have a website that's www.tellsomebody.tamu.edu. Tellsomebody.tamu.edu. Correct. And, the, and you can file an electronic report, whether it be anonymous or with your name. You could also contact various representatives on campus, faculty, staff, or student mm -hmm. representatives, and provide that report via telephone or even in person. So we have a multifaceted approach to reports. And that doesn't go to a person who stomps around in the situation. That goes to a team of professionals that work their way through in a very sensitive way to try to identify a problem and solve it. 
That's correct. It's a multidisciplinary team that represents all offices on campus that have the capability and resources really to intervene with all faculty and staff. Because uh, saving that, that individual, keeping them productive, uh, keeping them part of our community, really is the top uh, priority in addition to the issue of safety for everybody else. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. We want to keep somebody healthy on campus. Great story. appreciate your sharing it with us. Mm -hmm. Anna Satterfeld uh, serves as the Associate Director of Human Resources at Texas A&M, and she's a member of the Task Force on Campus Emergencies. Uh, appreciate your information. Mm -hmm. Hope you feel like you've learned a lot. That's the idea here on Bring It Home, is to take concepts of homeland security, national security, and even local safety and security. And we want to bring them home to you. So stay with us for more on this YouTube channel or on television. Good to have you back, continuing to bring home lessons of Homeland Security and national security to you. We're talking with Alyssa Stevens, who is our Director of Operations for the Integrative Center for Homeland Security. Alyssa, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. You join us to talk about just one thing from time to time, and that one thing today is? Today's one thing is the country reports on terrorism for 2008. This is a report uh, submitted by the U.S. Department of State. It's conducted by the National Counterterrorism Center. And uh, basically, this is over 500 of the counterterrorism experts from the intelligence community. They take a look at this. So mm -hmm. the country reports on uh, terrorism uh, comes out each year by, by Department of State. And what sorts of things does this tell us? Does it walk us around the world? What does this report tell us? Yes, it does. It actually analyzes the terrorism trends from many of the different countries around the world, those with the greatest terrorism capabilities, threats. It analyzes all of those. Well, one of the problems is always uh, the definition of terrorism. So I know they use a definition out of U.S. law that talks about attacks on innocence uh, for political purposes. Mm -hmm. Because there are some acts that may be uh, heinous acts, but they aren't necessarily terrorist acts. Right, that's correct. As in, there was an example recently where I believe it was in Iraq, a soccer coach mm -hmm. was fired and to retaliate he poisoned children's cakes. and. That wasn't considered a terrorist act, but it was still a criminal act. Still a criminal act. Right. Or uh, drug violence in Mexico, is that considered uh, terrorist under uh, terrorist activity for this report? No, it's not classified as terrorist activity. It doesn't threaten directly U.S. national security or nationals with a, a legitimate terrorist act. And uh, that would be, uh, the people that do that are called what, foreign terrorist yes. organizations? Yes, they're called foreign terrorist organizations. And to get this title, they have to be monitored and designated, and a report is written up by the State Department to analyze all the different aspects of why they are considered. And you mentioned a good deal of that analysis is done by the National Counterterrorism Center. Yes, that's correct. Well, uh, let's walk around and tell us what, what uh, things really did get your attention. Just very briefly, we're going to direct our uh, uh, listeners to, to the report here in just a minute. But what got your attention out of this report? Okay. Well, um, as has been the case for a few years, Al-Qaeda continues to be the greatest threat to the United States. They are losing ground. They've been moving out. They've been headed towards Pakistan, pushed out to different areas, as they're losing a lot of the support they once had in those areas. However, the Taliban and other smaller extremist mm -hmm. groups are gaining ground. They're kind of filling in this vacuum that was left by Al-Qaeda. They control parts of Afghanistan and Pakistan and uh, suicide attacks have risen steadily in these areas. Suicide attacks are up. Yes, in these areas particularly. In other areas of the world, they've gone down. Uh, very quickly, what about WMD? Is there any evidence of uh, that, that uh, reason we should be concerned about that? There is slightly. There was, um, there's always issue of WMDs, but mm -hmm. particularly in Iraq, I believe it was recently, they found uh, an abandoned biological lab where they'd been working on constructing these biological weapons. The title of that report is? This is Country Reports on Terrorism 2008. Country Reports on Terrorism by the Department of State. You can find it online at the Department of State website. Thanks for being with us on Bring It Home.
Welcome back to Bring It Home, where we take uh, issues of homeland security and bring them home to you. I'm really pleased to be joined today by Dr. Scott Lillibridge, who's the director of the National Center for Emergency Preparedness and Response here at Texas A&M. Scott, thanks a lot for being with us. Dave, it's good to be here. Tell me, what is the uh, Center for Emergency Preparedness and Response? What is this thing you direct? Well, uh, the National Center for Emergency Medical, and Medical Preparedness and Response is a new entity at uh, Texas A&M. It brings all the capacities that we've had in emergency management, uh, EMS, and first responder, and joins those with uh, the health sciences to create a, a hybrid activity that's logistically supported, yet uh, has all the best expertise in health and medical. And these are major resources. When you talk emergency management, we're talking about uh, uh -huh. the uh, uh, TEKS, a facility that trains uh, 70,000 responders a year here. You're talking about a major medical uh, center, uh -huh. a major capability that you're bringing together. We're, we're adding a medical and, and public health component to an existing capacity that we have uh, that's already world class. And this adds another slice of the pizza. So we essentially have the whole, <laughs> the whole training uh, capacity here. at Big Texas organization Center. here in College Station, but you also have some facilities in Houston. Do. Uh, uh, we have uh, uh, in the heart of the Texas Medical Center, mm -hmm. have one of our outlying teaching, training, and clinical sites that we have, mm -hmm. and uh, our administrative hubs right here at College Station, uh, linked with uh, uh, really at the uh, engineering and, and health science level. Um, Scott, I want to talk for a minute about your personal background because you are such a great example of what it means to bring together this, these uh, different backgrounds, different capabilities, and for to bring to you mm -hmm. them together in a new way. Would you, you, you give us a little background, your, yeah. your medical background and then your government background? Uh, Dave, you're, you're kind. I uh, wish my mother was here <laughs> to hear this, but uh, let me uh, kind of just talk about the philosophy of how I grew up. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've had a long uh, medical and public health career um, in different agencies, and one of the uh, most important things that I did is made the jump from treating patients one at a time uh, in emergencies when I was uh, director of a uh, chief of emergency medicine to uh, begin look at taking care of populations at a time uh, as I began to work in war zones, mm -hmm. uh, particularly civil war zones around the world, um, natural disasters and so forth. Uh, then after 9-11, these programs in the United States began to get big as we began to get concerned about developing that capacity for internal response. Who did you work with overseas? Uh, I've worked overseas with um, uh, many organizations, um, uh, Red Cross, um, uh, International Rescue Committee, mm -hmm. the United Nations, WHO, um, a number of uh, Department of Defense, the uh, State Department. And then within our government, you've, you've uh, focused on uh, uh, health care writ large within our government. You know, uh, when I came to the Centers for Disease Control mm -hmm. uh, as a uh, relatively young professional, and uh, uh, I went through the Epidemic Intelligence Service, mm -hmm. and uh, everybody has a beat. And my beat was kind of emergency health services. And uh, we began to uh, uh, provide assistance to health departments uh, imperiled by disaster in the United mm -hmm. States, and then began to work uh, overseas on uh, uh, providing technical response to uh, agencies taking care of refugees. You know, uh, Scott, 9-11 uh, really was a galvanizing moment in many respects. People look back now and they say, oh, we, politically we may have overreacted. It was a, had, a, uh, had a, a military aspect to it. But in this respect, uh, health care, public health, uh, medical capabilities, it really was a galvanizing moment. Explain to us why and how. Would you? A, a number of interesting things happened. Um, remember that the, the, the movement to put money in the public health infrastructure development uh, really started about uh, fiscal year 99, 1999, uh, with the Bioterrorism Preparedness and Response Program. Which was terrorist-focused as well, before 9-11. Absolutely, and uh, that was a program that I started at CDC. Um, it had about $150 million. That was big money in those days. <laughs> and uh, it, its its thrust was to build up surveillance laboratory training at state health departments so they could be ready for By an surveillance, emergency. you mean being able to see nationwide where are we having a lot of an unusual activity and exactly. therefore I track that I've got an outbreak. Look at those unusual cases. Um, it, it was a, in, to enhance disease tracking. Mm -hmm. So um, that started in earnest. Uh, after 9-11, a, uh, the supplemental that came in uh, brought three and a half billion dollars in the first wave uh, into the public health uh, and, and medical infrastructure. So from 150 million to 300 billion overnight. Overnight. So that by the end of that year, we had nearly uh, one to two billion dollars moving into health departments uh, to revitalize labs, enhance uh, disease tracking, ha you know, uh, add disease detectives, 
began to engage in training, exercises, and so forth, so that by the end of uh, uh, last year, uh, after we have about eight, nine years in this project, uh, we have significant capacities that we didn't have eight or nine years ago. Are you satisfied with the way the nation's moving in this field? You know, I think we've done some good things, but I, I think it's now time to begin to deal with the fact that uh, the infrastructure uh, that we want to galvanize in an acute emergency mm -hmm. largely resides in the private and academic sector. Let me give you a case in point. Um, when we had to deal with Katrina, we had literally thousands of people that needed uh, things like triage, evacuation, sheltering, hospitalization, mm -hmm. and so forth, things that are in the national disaster medical system, uh, which is woefully underfunded. Mm -hmm. um, um, that component needs to be developed as vigorously as we develop the public health preparedness. There really site. are no national beds. There are no national doctors. There, there are, are no national resources to send, are there? There are. No, there is no hospital standing uh, empty like a fire department ready mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. roll. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to borrow and co-op those expertise and those talents and equipment and so forth. Uh, let me give you a case in point. We're putting out nearly uh, six, seven hundred million dollars to health departments for preparedness activities. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in contrast, the National Disaster Medical System, which is the, the, the body that puts disaster teams, field mm -hmm. hospitals, mm -hmm. and so forth, uh, runs in about $40 million a year. Um, Tiny a for a national huge system. Huge imbalance. You're not going to galvanize the private sector, mm -hmm. the emergency health services, by, mm -hmm. uh, by uh, depending on volunteer teams to be federalized. Now, how will your center and Texas A&M, how are they impacting that? How, how are they trying to address those well, problems? Well, a little at a time. First of all, we're a state agency. Uh, in, a, in a state uh, university, state-sponsored university. So here at Texas A&M, our approach really is to begin building in Texas our version of a Texas disaster medical mm -hmm. system mm -hmm. of hospitals, uh, public health capacity, and disaster medical teams here at the state level to begin put some resources in the game at the state level. So while you might not be able to go to the federal government and say, uh, hey, where are your hospitals, you can go within the state of Texas, 900 miles by 1,100 miles, you know, and borrow and share resources. Exactly. The federal government works best if it can augment, support, mm -hmm. fund, and assist. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work so well in the response arena if it comes to just simply take over and stay. And so what your center will do is teaching, coordination, teaching uh, doctors, who, who exactly and how will you address that? Exactly. Our primary audience is the health and medical audience or public health and medical mm -hmm. audience of hospitals, clinics, public health departments. And the things that we do are, are teaching, training, research, service activities. Uh, on the response side, uh, we've spent our time developing a, a Texas disaster medical system uh, where we can all work and uh, galvanize existing talent. And the academic side, uh, we teach classes in the School of Public Health, uh, School of Medicine, and uh, we provide an oasis for fel fellowships mm -hmm. and um, uh, a way to really engage the other academic health centers in Texas, uh, including those from UT and North Texas and so it's forth. It's got 30 seconds left. We also have the advantage, if you will, that Texas has seen Katrina, Texas has seen uh, Rita, uh, Texas has seen Ike, and we are galvanized now in this area, aren't we? We are. Uh, we, we learned a couple things. One, in the recent response to Hurricane Ike, uh, we realize on the health and medical arena, we cannot depend on the federal government to come here and take care of our business. Uh, Texas is too big. Uh, the problems are too acute. Stretch from the border all the way to the city of Houston. I'm yeah. glad you're working on it. I'm glad your center's working on it. We've been with uh, Dr. Scott Lillibridge, who is the director of the National Center for Emergency Preparedness and Response here at Texas A&M, and we have been here on Bring It Home. Join us for more as you learn about homeland security and national security and how we bring these issues home to you. Welcome back to Bring It Home. This is the eighth in a series of lectures on homeland security, national security, strategy, war and terrorism, in which we're trying to take these concepts and bring them home to you. And today we're going to talk about the issue of insights into terrorism. This is a follow-on to previous uh, lectures where we talked about what is war and the nature of war, insights from war, how it's waged, and then how terrorism is different. What is the nature of terrorism? Today we're going to look at those insights. 
a very, as a very brief review, let me remind you that war is violence for political ends. It's waged under a set of rules. Now, uh, a lot of people uh, don't like this point because they say nations disregard the rules all the time. That's true. But it is true that they start with, they understand, they are bound with, to some degree, some set of rules, uh, operating procedures uh, between nations. You have to have some set of rules if one side is going to surrender to another. The nature of war is constantly changing. It's a balance we talked about between passion and reason. And that, ba that balance is influenced and thrown out of kilter by uh, the concept of chance. So you, war thr constantly threatens to spin out of control. What we're trying to do is control war um, in order to lead to victory. Victory being getting what you're will to s willing to settle for at a price you're willing to pay. And so we craft a strategy uh, in order to, uh, to achieve that control. A strategy is just a theory of cause and effect to achieve victory against a thinking enemy over time. These strategies will include a political strategy, an economic strategy, there will be a military component. Uh, new in the last few years, we began talking about the information component of strategy. And all of that, you have to remember, uh, you have to speak to the people at home, not just an enemy overseas. And so the acronym that's used is DIME or DIME-D. Uh, diplomacy, information, military, economic strategy, as well as a domestic strategy. And then Clausewitz tells us that we can strike at a number of centers of gravity as we wage war. We can strike at the people, at, their, at the military forces, or we can strike at the leadership. And we can attack in each of these their capability or their will. So that's how you end up bombing, uh, are you going to bomb uh, uh, homes and uh, try to terrify people, or are you going to, which, which frankly many people regard to not be within the rules, or are you going to strike the sinews, the economic sinews, or track railroads, or are you going to go straight after the leaders? This is how you wage war. Therefore, there's a logic, in other words, to waging war. You understand the, the war, you understand the enemy and yourself, you understand the nature of war, the enemy and yourself. Strategy creates your operations. Your operations tell you what tactics you have to use. Tactics suggest what fighting forces and weapons you need. And you, for all of this, you use all the national resources and elements of national power at your disposal. The problem is that terrorism is different. Is it violence waged for political end? Yes, but it's not just war because it's waged outside the rules. Is it just crime? No, it's not because it's for a political end. You can't just use law enforcement to deal with terrorism. Terrorism is, in fact, criminal war. It is, at its core, it's cheating. Now, some people don't like this term because it's, it suggests that uh, the states are always fair and the terrorists are not. That's not the case. What we said is that terrorism provides an unfair advantage. If one side's expecting to play by certain rules, for example, we don't attack civilians, and the other side says your civilians are fair game, then that side has an advantage. It unbalances your, the trinity. In fact, terrorism is designed to destroy control, to destroy the legitimacy of the system. The implications are that because you're using complex ways, means, and ends, complex, uh, complicated by illegality, that your solutions are going to be very complex as well. Very briefly, there are lots of uh, p potential ends in terrorism, very complex. Uh, you might be trying to separate, the, the country might be, the terrorist might be trying to separate themselves from another country. They might be trying to overthrow. They might be trying to return, as happened in uh, France and Algeria, you might be trying to return to a, formal, uh, a former uh, uh, leadership or way of doing business. This is what the Ku Klux Klan used terrorism for. It might have a religious basis. It might be just about some single issue or economics. The point is that uh, it could have very, very complex origins. It could be that the organization is just trying to survive and it went to terrorism in order to generate uh, publicity for itself. Or it could be that uh, it's trying to secure new resources and, and, and say, see, we're the ones who are actually fighting, uh, we're the ones who are actually destroying the enemy, send your resources to us. It could be that this is a newly emerging opportunity. There's a new center because, for example, the Americans have established a base in Saudi Arabia so we can attack them now. Or it could be there isn't any alternative. The, the enemy is simply so strong you have to attack using terrorism. And it can be that it fills a psychological need, that this is not e even about some final end, but it's about the way people feel better. They feel like they're oppressed and they feel better when they use terrorism. So the problem is there's no simple, single reason or purpose for using terrorism. We didn't care why the Japanese individual Japanese infantryman was waging war. He was raised, trained, equipped by a state. We only had to worry about battling the state. Here we have to worry about all of these reasons. So terrorism can be very complex also in the ways that it's waged. For example, it can be waged uh, st uh, state against state, as Libya against the United States. Non-state uh, can be a victim from a state, as the Nazis uh, waged against the Jews. A non-state might wage war against a state, Al-Qaeda against the U.S. Or finally, a non-state uh, might wage against a state, as we saw in Rwanda. 
In addition to the complexity then of state versus state, state versus non-state, uh, non-state versus state, and non-state versus non-state, very uh, complex set of ways in which force may be used, um, we can see that applying then the strategy is going to be uh, very difficult. How do you apply diplomacy, um, information, military, economic strategy? How do you uh, prepare your uh, domestic audience when there are these wide variety of ways in which the narrative is being played out? People are used to state against state within a set of rules. How do you explain this new situation to them? Terrorism is very complex in the means that are employed. Um, it, again, if we look at state versus state and so forth, within that, in each case, you might be countering using force against the people, the forces, um, or the leadership. And you might attack their will or their capability. And I remember how we said within a war, this is always like you have these six different targets. But this now can be played out between two states, as for example, um, when uh, Libya attacked the United States. Uh, it can be um, played out between state and non-state, as for example, when the Nazis attacked the Jews. And you can attack, again, leadership or, or people or their capabilities, their will, uh, or you can atta uh, attack their uh, capability or their wills, either one. It can be played out between non-state and non-state, as in Rwanda, where you attack leadership. Where you, you see how complex this gets and how quickly? And in addition, all of that can be done with illegal means. So that's the reason this is so hard to get your mind around. The point here is that war is very simple compared to terrorism. You have to understand the nature and the purpose or the ends for which war is waged, the context. You select an objective, you select a strategy, you, so you translate that into operations and from that into weapons and tactics, and then you just wage the war and adjust it between nation states. How much more complicated terrorism makes every aspect of these decisions. The implication then is terrorism is, is criminal war, and this changes everything. The, the, uh, the uh, mechanisms of, uh, of police and law are involved but can't resolve the problem. The mechanism of the military is involved but can't resolve the problem. It's waged against the legitimacy of the system. Everything the terrorist does is an attempt to overthrow that legitimacy. So terrorism is very complex and victory therefore is going to be long and extremely difficult. So what are the implications here? What's the most important thing for you to understand? I think it's that the people, the leaders, and the forces have got to understand the incredible complexity of this issue. You're not going to get a simple narrative. You're not going to get a simple solution. You're not going to get a simple victory. It's not going to happen overnight because on their side, you have to find all the reasons people are waging uh, uh, terrorism and unwrap them. We'll address this next time in our final lecture in this series. If you'll join us again on Bring It Home. Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, we're back with you to bring you more about homeland security and national security right back here to where you live. We're here from College Station, Texas, Texas A&M University, and we're being joined today by Dr. P.K. Carlton, who is the Director of Homeland Security for the Health Science Center at Texas A&M. Thank you very much for being with us. It's a real pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. Well, I say Dr. P.K. Carlton. I guess I could also say General P.K. Carlton because in a previous life, you were the Secretary, you were the Surgeon General for the United States Air Force. That's correct. Now, you took a very unique approach to that, uh, to that position. You had a lot of experience with combat medicine. And so before we get to Texas A&M and Homeland Security issues, talk to us just a second about what you did that was new, different, and special in relation to combat medicine as a Surgeon General of the Air Force. Well, Dave, my experience in combat medicine dated back to the Marine Barracks problem in 1983, uh, where we had some new tools in medicine that we had not had in the Vietnam War. They were the tools of salvage surgery and the ventilator. And after that 1983 experience, we sat down as a group and said, okay, we did exactly what we did in Vietnam. Can you look a mother, father, a husband, a wife in the eye and say no one could have done better? And we said, no, the world has changed. And so it took us 20 years to bring those changes with all the education, the training, mm -hmm. the, the modifications for the military, but to bring those into the forefront so that for this war, 
all of them were there. The training was there. The pieces were there. The far forward surgery was there. The critical care in the air. The family members being there on day two mm -hmm. and day three to hold mm -hmm. these loved ones' hands. Uh, and that's resulted in the lowest diet of wounds in the history of war. Well, now, that's important for a Homeland Security perspective because one of the challenges you had was you had to break across a lot of stovepipes. The Army had its combat medicine. The Air Force had its combat medicine. Uh, the Navy and Marine Corps had theirs. And you had to find a way to stretch across those, didn't you? Yes. And stretching across is fairly difficult. And the applicability to come to A&M was exactly the same. Every state does things differently. Every agency mm -hmm. within the federal government does things differently. And so how do you bring then an approach to say to the country, we can surge, we can cope with less than ideal circumstances, and remain dedicated to preserving life, uh, was what I came to A&M for. Now, when you made that jump from the Surgeon General of the Air Force to join us uh, in Homeland Security Program here at Texas A&M, <clears throat> uh, talk just a second about how you brought those ideas to bear, because those were not ideas that were common to uh, medicine, uh, civilian medicine, the idea of uh, having to do triage, large number of casualties, and so forth. Well, we taught the whole idea of surge medicine. We had uh, combined programs with our College of Architecture, with our College of Engineering. Uh, we fit well with the TEKS, NERTC, the National Emergency Response and Rescue Training Center, who were focused on other than the hospital. Mm -hmm. So it was a nice combination. And in a sales program that was teaching people how to do something mm -hmm. they never wanted to think about, uh, mm -hmm. we addressed this. We then had the opportunity to play it in Hurricane Katrina where literally a booklet that we'd put out from our College of Architecture Health Science Center program on how to build a surge hospital, people opened it and did it in Dallas and San Antonio and Houston and mm -hmm. College Station and in Baton Rouge. That pushed things along very, very nicely. Let's take just one minute and tell us one other special thing that you worked with, talking about surge capabilities. Here at Texas A&M, they had to do with an animal hospital. Would you discuss that? Yes, we had identified that the requirements for a surge hospital are space and ingenuity. And so we'd identified an opportunity with our large animal hospital here, a superb place, where we had oxygen, where we had backup power, we had tremendous amounts of space, that we could handle more than a thousand patients uh, in a surge situation. Mm -hmm. And then, lo and behold, we had to do it for Hurricane Rita. A and so it all came true. We had then the opportunity to work. How does that work? Well, let's take all those, that background, Surgeon General of the Air Force running the Homeland Security Program here uh, at Texas A&M, uh, working with state and local uh, hospitals, and let's apply that and ask you to step forward and talk about flu for just a second. We've been through this discussion of uh, H1N1. Everybody was all spun up, now everybody's all spun down. Give us your, from your experience, your perspective on what we've seen thus far, what we should expect to see in the future. Well, what we've seen thus far, we're now beginning to get a complete picture. It's been a full month since the world's been aware, but it's been three months since we've seen the problem. It surfaced in La Gloria, Mexico in February mm. of this year. Mm. Uh, the health department then got involved in March. By the time they finished their testing and we found out we'd seen something that looked new, uh, it was middle April and the world became aware of it. By that time, we had cases in Texas, Texas in California, Texas uh, all over. And so it literally had become a worldwide issue very, very quickly. Now, you've talked about that for many years. You anticipated that. What surprised you in either a positive or a negative way about the way this, pan this, this flu uh, uh, sort of unwrapped? Well, the very positive part of this was that there was a national awareness that we had a plan, the plan worked very nicely. Uh, we learned some things in terms of we're in the middle of a pandemic. The however is we didn't factor in lethality. And so everyone's a little bit relaxed right now that this did not turn out to be as lethal as we had expected it to be. But if you're a student of history and you go back to 1918, right. what we saw was Spanish flu came in late spring, then vanished for about three months, and then surfaced again this late spring discussion, very, very low lethality. And then when it came in the late summer, early fall, a higher lethality. And, and we suffered then 50 million deaths. So it's uh, not worldwide. over. So it's not over by a long shot. Now, um, it, it's, it's always easy to second guess people in hindsight. Uh, we saw a lot of schools close. We saw universities make uh, decisions about uh, graduation exercise. We saw some sporting events uh, canceled. In hindsight, uh, is that overreaction or were people being uh, properly cautious just because you never have enough information until it's too late? I believe that was being properly cautious. I, I believe based on the information they had, they made very intelligent decisions that said, can we do this some other way, still accomplish our mission, yet not expose people to the risks until we know more information. So, so I don't believe anybody overreacted. 
We've got just about a minute left. Would you share with us, uh, Dr. Carlton, your thoughts on how we, either as individuals or businesses, ought to get ourselves ready for what's going to follow on and appear again when the weather gets cold next year? Well, the great concern is that we probably have three to four months to now do what we should have been doing all along. That means to look and find out, okay, do we teach our school children how to cover with a sneeze, how to cover a cough, how to wash their hands properly, how to do the things that involve uh, lowering transmissibility. The other piece that we haven't really paid attention to is how do we handle the inside threat? When someone coughs or sneezes in an emergency room, for example, mm -hmm. how often did they infect other people within the emergency department? Mm -hmm. We know SARS started with one index case in an emergency department in Canada. In the close proximity, four other cases were infected. And so we're at now beginning to address the airborne threat as well as the other threats. So this will be a very busy three to four months. Are uh, businesses uh, taking proper precautions or are you concerned that they've relaxed a little bit uh, too much? Well, there's a bit of a deep breath going on. It says, oh, we dodged a bullet. And so I believe businesses are going to look and say, okay, what really should we do now? Because mm -hmm. all the public health measures involve social distancing. Social distancing is horrible for business. Social distancing is where you, we stay out of the mall, where yes. we close a school, where we don't go to the movies, we pull down churches and so forth. Exactly. And that's the antithesis of a happy business environment. Mm -hmm. And so the balance between proper public health and proper business is the most difficult one for our public health officials to, uh, to reach. I guess the key to that is that uh, leaders have got to step out and explain to the public what's going on. That's exactly correct. And that's our job right now is to make sure our leaders are well informed. Do uh, you have a thought about uh, where people might go for personal preparedness as they see uh, moms and dads, as they see the, uh, the uh, flu season come on next, uh, next fall? Where would you recommend they check? The Center for Disease Control has some wonderful websites about CDC. how to Center for Disease Control, how to protect yourself, how to protect your loved ones, what's smart, what's not smart. So I would advise people to go to that website, yes. Okay. Um, well, Dr. P.K. Carlton has been uh, the, the uh, Director of Homeland Security for the Health Science Center for several years here at uh, Texas A&M. Mm -hmm. uh, we really appreciate the expertise that you brought out of combat medicine into the field of Homeland Security. I know you've been a, uh, have a national, represent uh, a national uh, uh, reputation in that area. And then we also appreciate very much what you're doing for us here at Texas A&M. Hope you enjoyed that and uh, you'll stay with us for more on our channel, whether it's here on this television channel or whether you join us online where we take, uh, as we take issues on Homeland Security and National Security and bring them home to you. Think Research Channel.